the, the recording will be posted to our website. Uh, to it if you need to. I request that everybody please keep themselves muted um, if you're not speaking. And if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat bar on the side of the Teams window, and we can answer them either as we go through or at the end uh, as, as time allows. Uh, any follow-up questions or comments, please email to phillysei at gmail.com, and we will get back to you. Um, so uh, today's topic is the Maryland I-95 Express tolls, Toll Lanes Landslide Stabilization. Uh, there is a PDH available for this. It will be on our website. Uh, again, sei-philly.org. Uh, that is up presently. If you want to go and grab that yourself, we don't email them out. You can get it um, and record it yourself. Um, and our speaker today is, is John Volk. Uh, Vice President and Principal Geotechnical Engineer at AECOM in Philadelphia. Um, uh, John received his BS and MS, MS uh, in Civil Engineering from University of Delaware. Um, has 35 years of geotechnical ex engineering experience, and um, I've had the pleasure of working with him for a number of the most recent years. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, you know future work. I appreciate what John has done both in this area and nationally. Um, and more specifically, his soft ground experience um, in this region <clears throat> in stabilization, instrumentation, and soil structure interaction will lead us into John's presentation today. So, John, if you don't mind, go ahead and take your screen. Okay. Did Jim need to say anything? Or I know we'll, we'll close at the end with that. Then, we'll sorry. close with that. Okay, great. Thank you. And let me share screen. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully, you can see my screen here. I'm sorry do that everybody see that yes okay thank you and uh thank you uh particularly for uh sei and dvgi for the invitation and i know the dvgi folks well and and interface uh a fair amount with the structural engineers and so i just uh i am kind of curious though when i give a talk at dvgi i like to ask everyone to introduce themselves it's probably a little lengthy for today we won't do that but i i would be curious as to uh um, the the batting average of ge geotech to structural engineers here because it's always dangerous when there's more geotech engineers than than anybody else in a meeting. So if you guys could you can weigh in maybe by teams how many geotechs and structurals, but I, I'm seeing seeing quite a few of each, which is great. So thank you. This is a really neat project uh, that we were involved with uh, actually as URS Corporation back in 2013. And um, very interesting project, uh, express toll lanes on I-95, which if you've traveled from uh, you know this region, Philadelphia region to the south, I'm sure you've driven past it where they have the variable uh, tolls, which is always interesting to kind of kind of see. But this was right above, uh, just north of White Marsh, Maryland. But really interesting project that happened over several months, and I'll uh, I'll go through it. This is not a highly technical presentation in terms of equations and. It's uh, more of an overview, and I think uh, hopefully everybody can can follow it and get something from it. So the the formal name of the project was KH 1403 Express Toll Lanes. It was about a mile and a half of widening north of Maryland 43 uh, to Joppa Road. It was only 32 million dollar contract, but part of a billion dollars plus in improvements. And it was towards the end of probably close to I don't know maybe a decade, six or eight years of uh, of construction. So it was a relatively small contract that this was uh, this this occurred on, and this is a aerial view, again uh, I-95 from north of Maryland 43 um, uh, in in Maryland there. So uh, the widening was uh, over Honeygo Run, a uh, I guess you could say a stream or a creek. Uh, there was existing culverts there, 12 foot by 8 foot box culverts, but the the key thing was. There was about 50 foot high retaining walls that were proposed to minimize the environmental and right of way impacts. <clears throat> and that's really what, and it's to the, uh, what would be the bottom of the page here, which would be the uh, kind of the, the eastern part of the, uh, as, as you're going northbound. So the timeline was the, uh, the, the this design was done by URS Corporation. Uh, we were going through some metals. There was a supportive excavation design for these retaining walls in the February March. Um, I would just ask if if you're if we're not speaking, just to go on mute if you could. Jim, maybe you could. Uh, James, mute folks if if that's not the case. Um, that. Sorry, John. Thank you. Yeah, February March, uh, we did a supportive excavation uh, review of the designer. It was done. Uh, we were involved with the review of that uh, at some level. 
uh, March, April, the, the construction began. And then what happened in June was enormously important to the project it was they had something like nine inches of rain. It was the, the, the rainiest, uh, I think, June ever in that region. And sure enough, right as they had taken all the vegetation off and so forth, and you have, you know, the soil exposed, you have this torrential rains. And by mid-June, pavement cracking was noted on 95 on the uh, northbound lanes. And then this is just, they're going to see a number of pictures. I have some really excellent pictures from those on site. I was not, I was not personally involved at this moment. Uh, but it shows some of the supportive excavation excavation. And this was not this was not a very robust looking supportive excavation. I know John Pierce is on um, and I remember discussing this with him, but this this would not be something that would be probably held up real high as a really uh, well done supportive excavation. <laughs> I don't know about design, but certainly construction. It looked awful ragtag. It looked like it was put together. Uh, there, there was constant and apparently I'll go through it. There was literally as they were building it, there was creaking and popping of 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 elements of of the of the structure. But uh, such as what geotechs and structurals were up against on some of these projects. Um, so again, this was some of the June 10th. This is some of the cracking that was noted. It was very, very clear that there was something going on in terms of subsidence or settlement. Turns out it was some type of rotation, but uh, you can see you can see that's about June 10. So again, this is a nice view. This is actually looking southbound uh, on on the um, on the area that's about to be constructed. This is June 4. Very nice picture. So essentially, what what we have was a uh, at this stationing we had a uh, what was to be a retaining wall built up <clears throat> and. What we are seeing is, if you were to project this, we have a slip surface, you know, for the geotexas, slip surface, uh, failure surface that is, uh, I guess you could say, postulated here. But sure enough, we had some tension cracks, more or less, where we're showing the circle, the shear plane, kind of getting up near the asphalt pavement, and we ended up, which I'll show you later. There were some piles that were down to uh, looks like elevation about 20 or so, elevation 21. And, but sure enough, there was some other stuff going on here. So, so that's the first thing uh, to look at, you know, as you're you're kind of looking at the uh, the big picture, just to give a sense of what was going on. Of course, this wall was not built yet. They were just really beginning to put the support of excavation in, which would have been the uh, the red there. And again, this is what it's it's looking like coming in. It's uh, I guess maybe eight foot centers on the soldier piles. They did attempt some uh, tie back anchors. To various depths, um, and but but not not looking like a real robust wall from the get go here. Um, and again, just just some pictures to indicate as such. So the timeline was in July, so the movements were noted. I believe they even repaved the. Um, I guess the end of July, the pavement was repaired. So in July, they added tiebacks. Additional tiebacks were installed that went, I think, deeper, deeper into the uh, into the roadway. Um, there were soldier pile issues in uh, July. Welds were popping. I believe they were they they tried to amend that and address that as they were happening reasonably. And uh, in mid July, an inclinometer was installed. Someone said that's a good idea. See what kind of lateral movements we're getting, which is good. And uh, sure enough, the inclinometer was showing about one inch of movement per week, which is pretty significant for those uh, not associated, not used to or dealing with movements on a regular basis. That's pretty significant. So at the end of July, the pavement was repaired. This is the inclinometer movement. So an inclinometer is just a roughly a three inch diameter piece of pipe that has grooves in it that we we run a probe in with a that can tell uh, tilt basically. It's an accelerometer, but you can essentially see the movement and you can see we have a pretty distinct failure plane. This is what the geotechs, what we call the incremental plot. So clearly at about 43 feet, we have something going on. It's not moving and then it is moving. And if you look at this, this is only uh, the initial reading here was July 19. <clears throat> the red is July 26 and then this next one is July 31st. So this thing is moving at quite a pace in, in less than a span of uh, 
12 days, it has moved actually uh, in two weeks, it's moved a little over two inches in its maximum. It's pretty significant. So this thing is moving. And I got, I remember getting a call. So again, I'm just showing you the section again. So we would have been seeing the inclinometer more or less installed from about here. And it was pretty much detecting that failure plane at an elevation about 30, 35 or so. So um, anyway, so again, this is just a plan view of the supportive excavation system. It just shows it's being, um, um, just just kind of the layout, the soldier piles and numbering and so forth. Uh, this is the actual length of piles, which was very interesting to see how dramatically different the supportive excavation the designer had literally soldier piles that went very deep on the north side and then jump literally jumped them up, I think close to 30 feet or so and and then brought them up even shallower as they were here. It seemed seemed very interesting what assessment was made of the the uh, subsurface conditions. So it, it was kind of a very interesting thing, and I'll just speak personally for a moment. So our our Maryland, our Hunt Valley office was involved with this, and they called me, I think they called me a week maybe prior to this to say, hey, I may want to review an MSC wall design. And it was kind of a light kind of call. I said, okay, you know, send along whatever you need. And then sure enough, I don't know, it was a few days later, maybe a week later, he said, well, there's a conference call and we want you to be on it. I said, okay. So I actually got on the call and it was very, very interesting. Folks were talking and I said, well, um, you know, you have, uh, they brought up the inclinometer day. I really hadn't even seen much of the data at this point, just the way this thing had evolved. And, and I said, okay, you have lateral movements. Okay, it looks like you got about an inch a week. And I said, do you have any vertical movements? He says, oh yeah, we've had vertical movements too. We've even had to repave the, repave the road. So I said to them about 20 minutes into a call, I said, you have an active landslide and you need to do something immediately. And it was it was kind of interesting um, and it was just quiet. There was a dozen or 15 people in the room down near the site. And I said, you need to immediately bring in uh, 57 stone and we're going to build a counter berm on that roadway. And and we've got to work till dark tonight to do that. And it was very interesting, and they they did just that. I mean, we um, and I said I'll be down there first thing in the morning, but our our goal right now is you've got a lot of movement, and this is about as critical uh, interstate as you'll have if you want to say it between D.C. and New York. Um, and I said you need to you need to do this, and they did. So within an hour, they had 57 stone being delivered to the site, and we we basically this is what it looked like. They just started filling it in, didn't just kind of dozed it in, didn't worry so much about compaction or anything, just got it in. And sure enough, which uh, again, for the geotechs on the call who look at data, so this is this is probably, this is more than a day. Uh, I can't remember what date this is, but this is when we got a little bit more in. Might have been a couple days later because we ended up making it a little bit higher yet. But we basically filled in and created a counter berm and really arrested the movement. So what happened is, and this actually just shows the plots from August 6th on, but we essentially stopped the movement with that counter berm. So that was only a temporary. So again, you're getting this movement that's approximately a, laterally an inch per week, and we put a counter berm on and we essentially stopped it. So this is so this is plotting um, the inclinometer movement. So this would be the lateral displacement on the y-axis over time. And so you can see from July 19th, July 26th, July, 31st and then August 6th we had what 2.2.3 inches or so of movement and about whatever it is 18 days and sure enough as soon as we put the counter berm on it more or less stopped and then um, I could tell you about what happens a little bit later but it essentially stayed stop until they were doing something with uh, putting some piezometers in that and it ended up adding water to it which got it started slightly again but the bottom line is that counter berm was crucial in kind of arresting, at least stopping the movement temporarily. It didn't, it didn't solve the whole problem, but at least it stopped the, the real acute nature of, of what was happening there. So um, again, I don't know if anybody has any, anybody has any questions on that, but that's, this is a pretty clear movement and then pretty clearly not, not moving there. So, um, and again, that's elevation, call it 
35 and a half, 36. We'll, we'll probably remember that as we go back to our figure. So then again, there was just constant effort in terms of putting more tiebacks in at this point um, and, and so forth. So that was, that continued and attention to that. So the other part of the program was to then design, um, you know, the permanent fix, which this at least gave us a breather that the highway itself wasn't going to, you know, fall, fall away, slide away, so to speak. Uh, so we said, let's get additional inclinometers in and make sure that they're deep enough to capture any potential failure planes, which is also a big issue that we don't always, there can be more than one failure plane when we, uh, there's sometimes shallow ones and deeper ones. So we're going to make sure you get everything. Install some piezometers in the clays there uh, to monitor pore pressures and uh, water levels. Uh, borings and CPTs, we did it just a couple of borings. And um, I believe we did, you know, we also did some CPTs in here. And then also we have lab testing and um, um, some limited focus lab testing and then some we did literally had daily calls for instrumentation. If you've been involved with anything like this, you have daily calls to go over things. So um, this is the test point that we did, which we mobilized very quickly within a week or so. And we basically, as you can see, we're in the Potomac formation down here, which is a over consolidated clay shale for the geotex uh, that has slick sides and has lower residual shear strengths. Again, this area where we focused a lot of our um, you can see the plasticity index would be about, oh gosh, 25 to 40 or so. Um, so it's a it's a fairly plastic clay, and uh, and then it got into a uh, kind of a more decomposed in the uh, zone at about what uh, 53 feet, and then bedrock was at about um, 85 feet or so, a uh, dark gray nice. But this zone where we focused the testing was uh, we did some. Uh, um, Again, this was just describing Potomac formation, very stiff over consolidated clay shales. Residual friction angles are known to be low, like is even into the single digits, 8, 10, 12 degrees, 15 degrees or so. And that's a problem for the non geotex that that friction angle um, is very problematic and, and it is usually the cause of issues. And this region has major issues, the, the Baltimore region, the DC region, Northern Virginia has major issues with this uh, formation and has all kinds of landslides associated with this uh, phenomena. It also is present in various places. And I know in the Midwest, there's the Pier Shale uh, in the Dakotas, South and North Dakota, the Bear Paul Shale and others that exhibit this uh, this kind of behavior. In fact, it just for, for, for information, the Panama Canal has uh, some of the worst clay shales, the Cucaracha shale is uh, is very, very poor. Some of the some of the ones out in the Dakotas are as low as like six degrees residual friction angles, which means you have to build slopes that are six to one, six horizontal, to eight to one, even 10 to one in some cases to keep it stable uh, where you have this activity. And what it's caused by is I see Bill Peterson is on here. We have the uh, engineering geology. It's got like bentonite seams in it very very slippery clays that have like uh bentonite and the other type of um uh kind of clays in there that make it very very slippery so this is a um what's called a repeated direct shear test which is kind of a uh, the, for the geotex to, to do a ring a torsional a ring shear is ideal but a kind of a poor man's um Torsional shear is a repeated direct shear, which is a core of engineers test where you just you actually uh, with a piano wire shear the uh, sample, the clay sample, and then just you kind of polish it. You go back and forth and and run it. And sure enough, we got friction angles from this, which would be we would call residual or large displacement was about 7.8, 9.8. So this was in that 8 to 10 degree range which is again consistent. Sometimes it's hard to nail the uh, the exact worst location, even with test pourings or the, the worst data, but uh, we certainly were able to replicate some of the poor behavior. So that tells you how how bad it was. And so that's not very, uh, 
helpful. So, so now we go to the solution, and this is all. Remember, we're gone from August seventh, and it's now Labor Day weekend. Um, and we had uh, we had a big presentation the the Tuesday after Labor Day weekend, and we had worked through this. So we, we, there wasn't time for a tremendous amount of um, sophisticated analyses. And so we said, okay, what are our solutions? And we've, you know, our team has been involved with a number of, of um, kind of landslide stabilizations. We're the, uh, you know, this was the U.S. Corporation. We had Woodward Clyde legacy folks and have worked on a lot of these all throughout the country and beyond. And so, okay, we could flatten the slope. We could do something called a counter berm like we did with the stone, make that permanent. Uh, lightweight fills were an option. Uh, stone columns, you know, technically were an option and then um, drilled shafts as shear pins were option and pretty much that uh, the order going from uh, top to bottom is an inc increasing cost. So again, and so here we put together a table. A lot of times it's helpful just to do this in one table. So where you flatten the slope um, and then kind of discuss things like technical feasibility, cost estimate, you know, at least comparatively constructability, schedule, constraints, constraints, permits, are there any permit issues? And then kind of do a risk assessment. So flattening the slope, which which would have been this one here, where we would have had the permanent wall in. So again, this this MSE wall entailed cutting into the slope with, for the support of excavation and then, and then building the permanent MSE. So we would then put a flattening the slope there. We estimated that to be five to seven million. And the big issue with this one is we would have been taking wetlands and having to reroute Honey Go Stream would cause major permitting delays. And uh, probably would have done a decent job of arresting the failure plane, but um, in some ways it's, uh, you still have that failure plane in there, but you've just kind of put counterweight on the other side to stop it. So it's, it's not quite as positive as completely kind of arresting it, <clears throat> so to speak. Um, the second one is is a variation of that is a counter berm, which would have been just doing something. So so instead of taking the slope and violating the permit, what if we just did a counter berm? What if we did a, a geotextile wrap wall or something like that and and achieve the same thing? So that had a similar type thing, uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, same thing. It, it you're uh, you're increasing the factor of safety. Still not quite as maybe desirable as some of the ones that are a little bit lower, but it. it, it probably would have worked also. Uh, lightweight fills was a little bit more expensive at seven to eight million. This one was judged, so that would mean entailing um, <clears throat> excavating out this shaded zone that is de uh, at 45 degree angle and putting in say geofoam or elastazel or something like that. This was before Archie Phil Shields product, ultra lightweight foam glass aggregate, so we would would have been a candidate as well. So again, in this case, um, there would have been a supportive excavation wall near adjacent traffic, which is risky and limits the height of the geofoam. Uh, we would have lost one lane of traffic during construction. And again, you're not quite dealing with that failure plane that is in residual strength. You're not exactly arresting it. Certainly would have helped, probably again, reasonably could have worked. This is applied to situations like this, but um, wasn't. As we go down, you'll see some better options. So, stone columns. What about stone columns? So, stone columns is actually fairly decent, uh, a kind of a very robust one. You can just see by looking at it. This one really addresses the failure plane. Uh, and sure, this would have been this would have been good. The, the only the the problem with stone columns is really more. So that was estimated to be you know again on the more, little more expensive side. <laughs> a very good technical feasibility, but um, vibrating stone in place is not ideal for clays. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, there's also very few contractors. So, you know, you've stockpile issues and is it possible it could have been done? Yes, but there would have been a lot of staging of aggregate, getting rigs to benches exactly where they needed to be with traffic. <coughs> Had its challenges. Again, not not a bad solution definitely could have worked. There's never geotechnically, there's usually never one solution, but uh, but and it was good. We really like this one for arresting the failure plane, but it wasn't the most constructible, so we reflected that. 
So the last one is which the one we ended up with was the shear pins, drill shafts. So the most expensive at eight to 10 million, um, good constructability. But to us, that is, is we've had very good experience with structural solutions and particularly where you strap them together. So they have an excellent history. Structural shear pins have an excellent history of slope stabilization. Case on contractors, drilled shaft contractors have reasonably good competition in the area. Capping beam straps the caissons together, and uh, which we really like so they can share load, and I'll show to you what we did. And that will also assist in the temporary support of excavation, which was also part of the issue. How do you even get any of these things built in some of these other scenarios? So uh, what we had originally proposed was three rows of drilled shafts with a large capping beam, like four feet thick or so, or five feet thick or so. We ended up with two rows, but we'll go through that. And uh, but it really was nice because it really arrested the failure plane, um, albeit towards towards the toe. And it it also helped in temporary support of excavation. And then we pretty much just build the uh, support of excavation wall. By the way, this is about 300 feet long or so was the that needed to be addressed. So that is the. Uh, that's the array of it. So just again to go back to the table, it was uh, that's what was selected. We had a meeting that uh, Tuesday <clears throat> and we presented the options and then I think it was actually later in the month of September that we actually pulled the trigger on it. Um, and uh, maybe a week or two later, but it, we needed we reasonably pretty much got the drilled shaft contractors on alert. So the next stage was actually going into design in trying to make this get have this get built as quickly as possible. So we were trying to work within the limits of what reinforcing steel and and lengths of things that would be achievable. So uh, again, this is showing the three what we thought were going to be three rows of drilled shafts. We ended up with two on Charles show. So what we did was on the uh, soil structure interaction side of this, which is there is a technique for this that's been around. We've used it on other projects is um, <clears throat> where you go into L pile and you essentially uh, apply a loading here. It can be rectangular or triangular and you basically apply the loading to, if you will, break the pile or take the pile or drilled shaft to yield. So apply the same load and you so you apply that that loading here. And then you apply that same load in the stability analysis program as a resisting force. And so we had the two cases, the temporary condition, and we also had the uh, permanent condition with the MSC wall. And you basically want to increase your factor of safety. And again, this is really in the old days where I actually ended up drawing some of this by hand here to, to capture everything uh, the way we wanted. But this is essentially just this is a two scale drawing horizontal to vertical, but showing you what we we're up against. So it was, um, that's what we did. We we had our stability analysis. We had our, we had our failure plane reasonably from our inclinometers that we had. So we knew where it was moving elevation wise. And then we, uh, we knew where the exit point was. So we pretty much knew what our surface was that was failing. And then we applied these, uh, we broke the pile, so to speak, and then applied that load in the stability analysis and got like a, I think of like a 30% uh, increase in factor of safety. So we ran L pile for both freehead and fixed head. Um, and you could see our our loads were very high. We had, uh, you know, moments were, gosh, approaching 5,000 foot kips here. Um, a little bit less than that in the fixed head condition. Shear was about 400 kips and so forth. And, um, so you basically have your fixed head and free head conditions, and then you uh, you apply that you know the uh, the various diagrams, and you design it structurally for shear and bending moment. Obviously, an axial axial wasn't really driving much in the way here. Uh, axial load, and uh, and we ended up with putting uh, two rows in. Uh, we used six foot diameter drilled shafts, seventy two inch, and we had them. <clears throat> I'll show you a plan view so you can see it, but the inner row we had it uh, just a two diameter center to center spacing. So this was uh, just 12 foot center. So, so it was a six foot shaft, six foot space, and then yet another shaft. And um, in fact, this shows it here. So these are six foot diameter at uh, 
12 foot centers. And then the, the back row had six foot diameter at 18 foot centers. And then what we did is we strapped, we had a strapping beam. So this is a big four or five foot thick beam here. And then we actually connected these so they can share the load. And we found that to be very, very helpful. We've worked on some very, very large, even much larger landslides than this out in the Dakotas and other places and have really found that the the capping beams and structurally connecting these is a big, big help. So this is what we ended up with. And um, and there was about, uh, let me get the right number here. So let, let me go through this here. So we kept it at 60 foot length. We are trying to uh, keep the lengths, what is off the shelf. So we could get number 11 bars. So we had 22 bundles of three number 11 bars. So that's 66 number 11 bars around the perimeter uh, and so forth. That's what we ended up with reinforcing. And we kept it to 60 foot length because they were off the shelf. We were able to make that work. We designed it for residual friction angles of uh, between eight and 15 degrees. So it could handle the eight degrees as well. And we used the Florida Pier program, FB Pier, to design the capping beam. And this all happened in September, kind of the final design. We got contractors ready to hit the hit the ground running. <clears throat> so we had 36 foot diameters in the front row at 12 foot centers, 19 six foot diameter drilled shafts in the back row at 18 foot centers, 5,000 foot kip moment capacity, 600 kip shear capacity and a capping beam to act as a unit. So some pictures from construction um, and, and the, the haste at which we moved was remarkable. Um, here, so that's September 2013. Here's our counter berm, which is quite substantial movement still. And we also made this a little bit wider to, to facilitate the drilled shafts, um, the rigs and so forth to get in here and make it as a, of ease here. Uh, so we started, so the design happened in September and the construction started first week of October and was completed by October 31st. <clears throat> so uh, six foot, 60 foot length. And so we got all, uh, what did I say, 59 or uh, 30 plus 19, 49 drilled shafts in, in a month. They were able to open hole them. And then the capping beam took them a little bit longer. That was between like November and February, but just getting the shafts in made a huge difference. So Case Foundation put the drilled shafts in, did a great job. They, as I said, they were in the end, they were able to open hole it, keep water out of it. Um, quite the operation here and really went in rather smoothly. There's some casing going in, some temporary casing. And here is the reinforcing cage. I'll have some close ups of this. So again, 20, 22 bundles of three, uh, of three, so 66 number 11 bars being dropped in. Here's the concrete being placed. And uh, and there you go. So there's your your three uh, reinforcing bars, 22 of them around the exterior. We had cross hole sonic logging in each hole. So we have the CSL tubes in there. And uh, there you go. There's the CSL tubes being filled with water. Uh, and then this is what it looked like as they constructed them and had uh, we left a certain amount of casing in place. Um, get through the fill. And they were completed, uh, said Halloween day, October 31st of 2013. Case did a great job with that and we were able to get them in. And then it took it took a few months to get the capping beam constructed. But at this point, we really had uh, a permanent solution to stopping the highway from moving in the lateral movements and and then this is actually towards the end when the capping beam was nearly completed in the uh, January February time frame and then that following April they uh, they were able to build the wall um, and just build build up uh, the uh, MSV wall right on top of the uh, of the structure there and this is what it looked like in uh, as it, they were building it up in the March, March, April time frame. And by July it was uh, completed. And they didn't quite have traffic on it, but they were paving it. And uh, so 
the last thing would just be the potential causes. Um, I'm just about done here. So uh, we got into actually the the uh, MDTA was actually very interested in um, what exactly happened here, and we actually did a bit of a evaluation of this as best we could. Historic rains in June were were obviously a huge part of it. Cover soils are removed, and then rains get in and really infiltrate. We also found that there was from the 1960s a side hill fill, meaning that they had filled in the side. This is always somewhat problematic, or a lot of times problematic, when you so fill the side of a hill. And we were concerned that the quality of the construction and potential water pathways, not sure they had a drainage blanket or that they had really locked in kind of that fill back in the construction technique of the 60s. Did they really bench it properly? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But we thought there was a potential water pathway. I'll point to that in a second. And this is the actual Honeygo stream that perhaps uh, when they did this, again, side hill fill that they hadn't, there was a culvert there, but they hadn't completely dealt with all the way the water was being um, addressed, shall we say. <clears throat> Should have been a the best practice is to have a drainage blanket in there so that there's no pressure water buildup on the side of those fills. And the other is, you know, the length of the soldier piles <coughs> were certainly a concern. And uh, it was a low spot for drainage, so it was a natural low for things there too. So uh, so that is that is uh, a concern there. And again, yeah, this is just the from the original plans to show the low spot. Here is the culvert. And um, so forth. So certainly you, I think those of us that have been around failures know there's never there's never one just one thing. It's usually a combination. So maybe maybe some poor construction in the 60s combined with the fact that this thing is opened up and you get nine inches of rain over three or four weeks was just enough to 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 send it. So I think we do have to be careful too because we do recommend a lot of these uh, MSE walls be uh, you know constructed. But the other is the, the other really big takeaway is um, doing supportive excavation design when you have a slope involved like this is is actually very, very, very tricky. It's not it's not like uh, a lot, we know a lot of supportive excavation designers are, structural engineers that don't necessarily do the geotech in some cases, and it can really get into um, some pretty major issues there. So so summary of, of the project, there's an identification of a slope failure. Uh, slopes and wall combinations are more challenging. There's much greater shear going on, and it's, it's really tricky. And I know John Pierce is on here who does the most of that in this region and knows this so well, but it's, it's, it's a very, very tricky combination. And when you get heights approaching 40, 50 feet with these slopes, it's also a big issue. Um, remember, things kind of escalate. If When we deal with things that are 15 feet in height or a 20-foot supportive excavation where you're, you know, everything's horizontal behind you, that's one thing. But when you have slopes and approaching 40 feet and above and things start to escalate like exponentially, <laughs> if things aren't exactly right, it's not, it's not, it's not uncommon that there's issues at times, so um, be careful. Uh, obviously, a high-profile major transportation route, public safety, uh, instrumentation to assist it in using the observational approach to kind of identify things and confirm when things were stabilized. And then uh, the other big one was we really had to choose, all, we were moving so quickly, we had to choose off-the-shelf materials in an emergency. Um, so we tried to keep lengths and what materials could be used, we had to take into account as well. So, so that is all I have, James. I'd be happy to um, take any questions if there if there's time. So, thank you, John. We do have a little bit of time here. Uh, no questions coming in just yet, so we'll leave the chat open. Uh, I did have a couple myself. So first, back to your uh, mm -hmm. your question. The question uh, that we're split evenly on responses. Oh, looks like Geotech just took the lead, about half and half between Geotech and structures. So. Oh, the big okay. takeaway, <laughs> the takeaway I have from structures here is uh, know what you don't know and find the people who can do it. Otherwise, it's going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and also want to point out that you were uh, your option number one to fix this thing was to flatten the curve, which was about seven years early. We had to deal mm -hmm. with that, you know, in 2020 uh, through mm -hmm. the pandemic. So you just had to wait for that 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 solution to come to fruition. 
Yep. Um, uh, two questions from me. Uh, one was you, you saw almost three inches of movement after you started monitoring it in July of 19. Is there any idea what the movement before that monitoring was? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good question. So <clears throat> one of the things that, and I've, I've done a good bit with um, kind of soft soils and, and unstable situations, soft ground or landslides, but one of the key things is that really kicked it off for me was the the amount of movement, the relative amount of movement vertically and horizontally. When I heard that we had an inch a week, and then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's that's a lot of movement. How much did we have vertically? And we and to the point that they had to repave it, I knew they had experienced at that point not a half an inch. They had experienced multiple inches. And we obviously had missed at least an inch a week, probably between June and July. So it's very likely laterally that while we caught from August 6th to June, July 19, we caught, you know, more or less, what's that, 6 and 12, 18 days, we caught 2 and 2.3 inches. Yeah, you should be able to extend that at least into early, early June. And uh, yeah, we, this thing probably easily laterally moved closer to, you know, 6 or so inches laterally. And we, it seems to me, we also had, uh, again, they repaved it, but they probably easily had, you know, multiple inches, whether that's three or four or six. And and the, the road may have rotated, dropped together for part of it and then sheared or something. So there was probably close to six inches of movement, both laterally and maybe as much as that four to six inches vertically. So that's what really set it off, um, you know. For the geotechs and soft soils, Chuck Ladd has in his Trizaghi lecture has deformation ratio in soft soils, and it's it's a little bit different than this. Not exactly the same, but it's not it's not dissimilar. But that you know when you have deformation ratios of 0.2, meaning 20% of your lateral movement of your vertical. So if you had a foot of if you had 12 inches vertical and you had you know three inches of lateral that could actually be unstable conditions. Well, we clearly, to me, had gotten past that, you know, one fourth or 20% or 25%. And uh, that's why it was pretty clear on the phone that, you you know, like you have to act immediately. That, that was the other part that was very interesting. Just uh, everybody kind of really did what they needed to do here. And we kind of stopped it so that there was nothing catastrophic that happened beyond this. But it, it, you could also see it was moving. This son of a gun was moving for probably two months. And, uh, Fortunately, it didn't go completely or it could have been very catastrophic. So. so did I answer your question, James? One last one last one structurally yeah. was you, you considered the caisson heads fixed as opposed to free. Was that because of the, the strap beam or was that something related to the soil well, restraining we, the top? Well, we actually in this case, actually, I do want to talk about that a little bit. In this case, I th we looked at it both ways. So what we try to do is actually cover our bases because we didn't do we certainly believe that it would pro it wouldn't be one or the other exactly, <clears throat> but we we actually did design it for to cover both cases. So we designed it for a moment of 5,000 foot kips, which was given to us by the freehead, and I think our shear was 600, and so forth. So we were kind of cover trying to cover all the bases. What we would normally do now, and we do this with more regularity, is use we happen to use flak. Um, I think the geotechs are familiar with this, mostly flak or plaxis is used, um, but the finite element codes and finite difference, flak is finite difference, are becoming so quick to code them up. We're using them with more and more regularity, and um, and it really, really gives good insight into soil structure interaction, doing it that way, uh, you know, done correctly with the right parameters, the right input, and the right people doing it, but um, but this simplified method did work, but yeah, uh, but we didn't just use fixed head, James. We, uh, we, we, we tried to cover our bases because we thought it might be in between. Understood. Okay, a couple questions coming in in the chat. Um, did the specifications or the SOE designer consider the larger global stability for the timber excavation? Um, was strength testing performed on the material during or before construction? I think the answer is probably no, although they did use the deep X program. So there is a mechanism in there to look at so-called global. Uh, and I'm trying to remember now because some of this goes back years. Um, I'm trying to remember. He 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just actually not going to say, I don't know exactly what he looked at or did or didn't. He probably certainly would have looked at, at higher numbers though. What he, what he certainly did, did not look at is, and it would not have been designed necessarily, <clears throat> not that, <laughs> It was not designed for those residual numbers, those residual friction angles. He would have used more traditional peak numbers that you might see in clays and 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 in that. Re but that's where you also have to be very careful um, that these. Th it is not uncommon. There is a lot of landsliding in this region with this Potomac clay from there, from about this area down to northern Virginia. And um, yeah, I mean, it has to always be when they're working at that, they have to always keep an eye on that. Uh, Chris Reese asks if he saw wick drains at the toe of the slope and what purpose would they serve if they were there in the Potomac Formation? Uh, no, there were no wick drains. Bob Crawford, any any accommodations made on the capping beam to assist with sliding of the MSC wall? Or was that not a concern in the final condition? It's a good question. No, I don't believe so. Um, it, remember, it wasn't it wasn't completely concreted, so you would have had soil to MSE here. But yeah, I I can't remember if we would have specified having. I mean, technically, you would have had your uh, you know like your 57 stone sitting on this stem here of the capping beam connecting the two beams there. So, but this would have been in in that rectangular in between would have been soil to stone. So. So no, I don't believe there was any anything special done there. No, Bob. One last question here is how was the pile force applied to the resisting forces equal over all slices? Uh, how was it? Ratch, uh, if you want to come off mute and clarify your question there, if. What was that? Yes, I was asking how was the the yield pile force distributed over the slices when you're doing your Bishop or Yambo analysis? Yeah, I have to think here. We generally we generally like to spread it out if we can. I believe it or not, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to date myself here, but I actually use stable. I used a version of stable for this here. Um, we didn't actually use everybody uses slope W a lot of times these days for these kinds of things, but um, but I was uh, I was actually having a little trouble with slope W doing making getting the <clears throat> forces applied exactly the way I needed to. So I had done it before in stable and just went back to that. So actually, I believe I, I, I don't know exactly. I'd have to. I, I don't know. I could get back to you on that, but I don't know exactly how stable handled that. All right, thank you. And I also had another question. Uh, the differential yeah. settlement between the I believe you're you're still going to see the cracking of the pavement uh, on the top if you if you put your piles if you put your caissons. Uh, there's some differential slipping, right? How is that accounted for? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Say it again. What what is the issue? Uh, if you put your piles at the toe of your of your slope and your slip surface starts from the top, uh -huh. I, I believe there is some. Differential slipping up until you arrive to the pile, so you're. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Yes, yes, yeah. Like you could still agreed. I, I mean, agreed. I don't believe. Again, the one thing, the one regret here is, when they built all this, <clears throat> we were trying to get them to actually put. Um, we lost. We ended up losing our. We had our inclinometers in place. It's always wonderful to have these in place when it's fully completed. Um, now we wouldn't have been able to have any inclinometers here, but we certainly would have had the surface here. But I and I agree with you that it would have been ideal to kind of have some arresting of the surface up higher. But I don't believe they had any issues. I drove that road repeatedly, you know, at various times. I don't know that they've had any other issues in that regard. But we did. We were trying to get an inclinometer or two through the drilled shaft and actually beneath it to make sure there was it was fully. And I and we couldn't swing it. We had uh, we, the contractor was giving us a bad time about it, and 
it ended up being, you know, January and uh, we ended up, I had to, I had to punt on that, but so we didn't get any final instrumentation, but it's, I know from driving it, it didn't appear that there was anything going on here, at least anything that I could really notice. So. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, John. Um, uh, John, I'm going to flip over to our outro slides. Anything else in closing for yourself? Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you for letting me present. This was uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, got comments coming in. A uh, great presentation. Thank you. And I'm sure Jim will give a, a thank you on behalf of DBGI when we get over to his slides here. Um, okay. So uh, I pull my my screen up here. Um, John, we do uh, we do very much appreciate your time and preparing and uh, expertise mm -hmm. and passing on the questions and answers here. Uh, so we will uh, send you a one of a kind pint glass with a SEI Philly on there. Um, and to everyone else on the meetings here, uh, our upcoming schedule is March 24th. We have a bridge architecture and aesthetics meeting. Uh, April 28th is our AC Philadelphia joint meeting. Um, that's uh, on that day, whether it's uh, midday or evening is to be determined, but it will be virtual as well. Um, and then on May 20th, we have our SEI golf outing. <clears throat> One last announcement that our scholarship is we have just a, a couple days left to receive applications and we'll be awarding it. So if, if you know of anyone, any students or children that might be interested in school right now, um, please get in touch with us or check our website for scholarship information and we'll be announcing and awarding that in March uh, this year. Um, and then a uh, final uh, save the date, uh, March or May 20th uh, on Friday, uh, nine o'clock, I believe is the start time, will be our second annual SEI golf outing. Uh, benefiting our scholarship fund. Uh, and with that, I'll flip over to uh, Jim. Do you want to take our DVGI slides? And thank you for joining us today for this joint meeting. Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, and thanks, John. The great presentation. Very, uh, very informative stuff. So pretty cool. Um, just a couple announcements for us. And I guess I didn't put it on this slide, but uh, late last week I was uh, notified that uh, DVGI actually won the 2022 uh, Best Chapter Award for uh, Geo Institute across the whole country. So uh, congratulations to all our members and our, our board and everybody that participates. Uh, you know, we really have a great organization. We put a lot of great talks together and um, a lot of collaboration with other groups, too. So we, we look forward to our SEI talk and our ASCE talk and, you know, uh, the different younger member forums and things like that. So um, great, uh, great accomplishment for our organization. So um and it's all because of the, the members and the, the response we get from folks. So appreciate it. Um, just a couple other quick things here. Uh, you know, sponsorship requests, Bob Crawford sent them out. Um, so if you want to get in a newsletter or and get on our website, reach out to Bob for sponsorship information. Uh, Neil's putting the uh, newsletter together uh, each month now. And so if you have anything, um, advertisements or information you want to include in the newsletter, um, send that over to Neil. Um, our DVGI 2022 Project of the Year uh, um, award is still open, so submit the, get those submitted by May 1st. Um, we're going to pick a winner and announce it at the May 17th meeting, and then um, you know all the projects that are submitted will be featured in our newsletter, and then uh, the, the winning project has an opportunity to present at one of our meetings for uh, next year. So um, that's a couple quick announcements there. If you can flip the slide, James. Um, our next couple meetings, uh, March 29th, is going to be our student night at Villanova and we're going to as long as things continue the way we're going we're going to do it in person um, keynote speaker is going to be Rick Brinker um, he was the the, the uh, geotech engineer for uh, 2021 and then we'll have a couple student presentations there as well uh, a couple we'll give out our scholarship awards that night and uh, we did receive 20 about 20 applications for that so our, our scholarship team is reviewing them, um, working on making a selection, uh, and we'll be awarding them in May. Um, James talked about the ASC meeting uh, on April 14th. Uh, it's a joint meeting with all the different groups. Um, Silas Nichols from uh, FHWA is going to give a talk for uh, the geotech portion of it. Our last meeting of the year is then in May on the 17th. Um, Dr. Zhu from Rowan is going to give a uh, presentation on uh, the investigation of thermally and mechanically balanced structural design of insulated pavements. And then just a couple other events we got planned over the next couple of months here. Um, we're planning an event with the Younger Member Forum in March at Aero Aggregates for a, a tour of their facility and a social hour. 
Um, we're working on a short course in Epics here, the early part of March. I think we're, we're working out the details here, but we're going to have a two-hour short course on engineering Epics for those that need that for their PE renewals for New Jersey and New York. A couple of other states might need that. Um, and then the last one there is uh, we're also planning our golf outing at Kimberton um, on, uh, in June. I think uh, we're looking at either the 16th is a Friday, I think, that, or the next Friday after that. But we haven't confirmed up a date yet. So that's what I got. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity to meet together with the SEI group, and we look forward to doing it again. So, yeah, Thanks, Jim. We'll, uh, we'll all go out there and hack up the course in May and then uh, come back and lower our scores in June at the DBGI outing. Sounds good. Yeah, nice. Okay, with that, that is our, our meeting time today. Uh, thank you again uh, to John and uh, everyone who attended. Uh, please feel free to email if you have any questions or need anything further. Have a good day, all. Thank you, James and Jim. Yep, thanks, guys. Have a great one.